problem nine. I actually made a recording yesterday, but uh, I wanted between two takes to correct the webcam while I was pausing. And then the connection, the USB connection failed for a second and Boko screen didn't take that lightly. So the entire recording was lost. But I have this crit uh, What's called uh, blackboard that I'll that I'll try to explain what I did, and I think that should be sufficient for the first question. Now we have an elliptic curve, and the polynomial f has real coefficients. And in case there's one rule, one root, one real root, then the uh, elliptic curve, the real part of the elliptic curve uh, should be isomorphic to R over Z, that which equals S1. So geometrically that's easy to see. We have only one branch on the elliptic curve and uh, it's uh, tends to infinity both ways, which is the unity. This is half the unity. So it has the topological structure of S1. So this seems quite reasonable. But we would like, of course, to make a, an explicit isomorphism. And in B, where we have three real roots, uh, then the left curve or the real part of the elliptic curve have, have has two branches and um, if we add two here they will usually be, uh, intersect here so they lie here to still be on the same branch so that uh, this would be the null branch adding two of, from this will give a point on the other branch so that must be the point one branch. So it seems quite logical, but of course we have to prove it. In particularly that we don't get, uh, and we add two points on this branch, we don't get a point on the other branch. That doesn't seem likely because of the continuity of the addition formulas, but um, I'd like to, to make a formal proof so, what did I do? We start with the complex plane and then map it into the elliptic curve, uh, which lies in the two-dimensional complex projective plane. And um, so we have an exact sequence from north to the lattice into the complex plane. Um, one rule, one root was real, so the others must be complex conjugate. And uh, this L is for subgroup, so there's a projection until uh, it should be L minuscule. And we know that it's uh, isomorphic to the torus. And this mapping is on to the gift to naught. Um, now we have to consider the real part of this curve. And uh, then we map to the x axis. So, in general, uh, this mapping maps to the whole complex plane, uh, the first coordinate. So, we map to the curve and then to the first coordinate with the Weierstrass p function, which is a complex plane. And we are only interested in the real axis here. So, uh, the question is, in this complex plane, which points will map to the real axis, and which points will map to this part of the real axis, 
where the uh, second coordinate is real as well. Down here, the second coordinate is imaginary because the derivative, or not the derivative, the square of the derivative equals f of the x values, which are negative because this is the only root, assuming a is positive, of course, or you have to, to mirror everything I say. So which points up here map to this part of the real axis? And we could go the other way around. This one, uh, if we go directly to infinity, it's connected to to one half, or it comes from one half omega two. And the further, if we integrate along the x-axis, the further we go to the right and start, the smaller the, uh, the integral will become, tending eventually to naught, and all the values being real. So that means that this, from one half down to naught, that, what, that's, that maps to here. And then it's a multi-valued function, so it's all these um, parts of the complex plane. Then choosing the other branch, we get the negative values. So thereby we fill out the x-axis, this line and this line. So that's what I wrote here. Um, n times omega 1 plus all the real numbers and then we have to uh, I was going to say divide by L um, I forgot what it's called so let's just call it that and it stands to reason that that's uh, all this uh, all these, I think we should do it a, a bit more uh, explicitly. So, x, that's the uh, first coordinate, and that's just the real numbers itself. And then um, the second coordinates come here, so that's omega 1 times z. And this is actually the product because we can consider it to be two coordinates. And then L can be written as now the real axis first, that was omega 2 set times omega 1 set. And then we factor it. And this is equivalent to R modulus Z, which is, of course, isomorphic to S1. And this is just the uh, naught group. So the result is as it should be. So that was what I did that seemed correct. Next, I worked on question B, and I wanted to find the, uh, well, we know here that uh, the, the real axis to the right of, uh, of the solution maps to, or comes from the real axis up here. So what about the, uh, the rest of the real numbers? And then I imagined that we know that this map to 
real numbers. So I thought that might, had to be the solution. That uh, uh, And we also know when we have three real roots that um, they, they form a rectangular lattice. So I simply thought this is what maps to real numbers, as it does. And it's negative real numbers. But I'm not sure about negative real numbers. Yeah, I think it's right because they're imaginary and in the expansion. Um, oh, never mind. In the power expansion of the Weierstrass function, I was going to say, but um, let us leave that for a moment. The point is that these points do not map to the real part of the projective curve for the simple reason that the derivative is imaginary. And you can, if the values are real here, or let's go up here, if the values are real, then uh, if you take the difference uh, the difference quotient, first the by values, they are real, but the difference between the set values themselves is imaginary. So the derivative must be imaginary. And that, of course, also follows from the series expansion of the derivative. So they don't belong at all. So we have to work on that again. Actually, it's very simple. Um, we have E1, E2, and E3, the three roots. And the uh, interesting domain is this, between E1 and E2. So I should have seen that immediately. E1 and E3. Now, um, we already know that these come from the set values. Now, what was it? Um, M plus one half omega one plus n omega two m plus one half omega one plus n plus one half omega two and this one came from m omega one So we know all the points that the roots come from. And the, the areas we are interested in, or yeah, the area on the x-axis, that's this. Oh, well, it didn't get red. It's this interval towards infinity and this interval. And now it's easy to see that um, to see where they come from, because uh, this one we already have handled. This this area we have handled, so this is the interesting one, and you can see that we go from um, if we just take one half omega one to. Uh, one half omega one plus one half omega two. Now omega two is real, and the integration along this path is real as well. So that means we go uh, parallel to the real axis, and that means that oh. 
if we have the complex plane here with the real axis and the imaginary with omega 1 and omega 2 then the point in the complex plane that maps to these two domains consist of this mapping to this one and this mapping to this one. So we have the um, Yeah, how can we write this set? It's um, first we can use all real numbers for the for one of them, and then the second coordinate that's one half omega one z, and we have to. I still forget what that's called to to divide it by the lattice and then we factor it set here I'm sure you caught that And then we use the uh, map um, x maps to 1 divided by omega x and x maps to 2x divided by omega 1 couldn't that possibly be not no you E2 could be 0, but not omega 1. And then it's equivalent to or isomorphic to R slash Z modulo R modulo Z times we we'll just do like this Z modulo 2 Z. And I believe that was what we had to prove. Right. So, that was what I had hoped to do. And then afterwards, uh, I realized that these two theorems on uh, group isomorphisms I'm using with expanding it and uh, using a map actually needs to be proven. And I don't think it's difficult. Uh, the point is that it's suffer more uh, material. I mean, it's really something one should know. I didn't. When doing the computations, I used them without much thought. But now that I'm recording, I think that uh, it ought to be explained, or at least proven. Uh, so, 
first one, that is that we uh, actually can factor out the the modulo. Hmm. I need a break. I'm back. Um, well, maybe I should say one thing before going on here. Oh, that's we need the. Uh, I think we should just note that the. Uh, what the map is the the isomorphism. If we have a real number and an integer, then we map to the real um, number up here and this one is times omega 1 so we get a point on one of these lines and then we just use this map then we end on the curve so that's the isomorphism now back to this proof first uh, that H1 point H2 is a normal, a normal divisor. Or should we call them G1, G2? I think that would be more appropriate. I would just use the definition on the of the operation. I use multiplication as the form here. And then they are normal devices, so we can interchange the direction or the order. And then we can pull it out. times trivial and next we should divide uh, define a map either going this way or going this way I think going to the left is the obvious choice So we have a map phi on, yeah, oh, I didn't I say I would use the multiplication notation? So this maps into Now, is this well defined? If we two, if we take uh, two different, oh yeah, that's simply by the uh, definition of the of how the product works. That we first take this times this and this times that. So it's well defined, and then uh, it's trivial, really. Oh, I have to show, of course, that it's. Uh, one to one and on to. That's trivial. Don't care. Now, the next one that's the uh, the point where I multiply by two divided by omega two. Uh, 
Oh, I do it. I do it, actually do it. I use it to both of the. Uh, I use it both here and here. And also, of course, here. Um, I said it's not. It's of course this, which probably is of course. Now, first we need to show that we do have a normal divisor. It's, it's K, we should write minuscule K. So K comes from some G. Because it's an isomorphism, phi has an obvious, an, op, uh, an inverse map. So we can set g equals to phi to the minus first of k. And by isomorphism, by normality, by isomorphism, or homomorphism rather, By definition, right. So this one is proven. Next, we have to define a map. So there's only one way to do it. Oh, there are several ways, but they're equivalent. So uh, we go from here to here. Maps G into K times uh, phi of H. So we have to show that it's well defined. So if we take another representative we must show that it gives the same and obviously it's homomorphism, but it's well defined, this is what we need to show first. Um, so if we take another representative of this, and of course these sets are the same, then that maps into and then because it's a homomorphism and this equals phi of dh uh, which is exactly what it should so it's a, a well-defined map, and obviously on to, because um, this is on to. So it's really trivial. So that's, that was really not interesting.
So, I believe I have answered problem nine by now.